Good morning and welcome to our live talk program. This is Lloyd Grubb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our live talk program covering natural health on your Wednesday morning, Rise and Shine. Natural health this morning we're covering and we're looking at this topic, Britain appoints Minister of Loneliness. Britain appoints Minister of Loneliness is our topic. I have two different things I'm going to share with you this morning and that's going to be my main talk here this morning. So welcome to our live talk program. Hopefully you had a blessed night rest and you're ready to take on this day today and if you listen to me in the evening you had a good work day <laughs> so welcome again let us pray thank you again dear lord for your love for the way that you teach us and guide us by your word by the experiences in life dear lord and by the fellowship of the saints may you bless us dear lord as we talk and study together about these things that affect our well-being bless us we pray for christ's sake amen so again, um, our main focus this morning is um, Britain appoints uh, Minister of Loneliness, loneliness um, to minister, I guess, to deal with the problems of loneliness that happens in um, the society there. So this is what um, we'll be focusing on this morning here as we do our live talk program. So that will be the second thing I'll talk about. I'll briefly talk about um, this piece here that um, is um, found in motherjones.com and it's entitled as diet related illnesses surge a new kind of pharmacy dispenses fruits fruit and vegetables fruit and vegetables so this is what's happening here this is written, written by muddy um, oatman six years ago james um, stencil 62 a former long haul trucker decided to move from Ohio back to his hometown of San Francisco to live with his aging mother. There was just one problem. His enlarged heart, high blood pressure, and diabetes made his body so swollen he couldn't get on an airplane. Doctors had to drain 75 pounds of fluid before he was well enough to fly. By the time he walked into a public health clinic near his mother's house, his blood pressure was so high that people were telling me, you should be dead right now, or right about now. Recall Stan Stancil, who's African-American and sports, um, who, who's African-American and sport a white chin straw beard. He was uh, put on medication. He also met with a nutritionist who urged him to cut down on salty, fatty foods like fried chicken, mac and cheese. After he learned to prepare his favorite dishes different, differently, his blood pressure plummeted. It's now back to normal. Stancil no longer has to take so many pills. Yet, thanks to a new program, he still frequent frequents a pharmacy at Silver Avenue Family Health Center. Center, only this one is filled with prescriptions for things like pears and squash. Uh, the so-called food pharmacy brings together the resources of a food pantry with the acumen of clinical nutritionists and the flair of a farmer's market, mostly to tackle high blood pressure and diabetes. Patients who receive a referral can stop by for donated groceries, recipe demonstration, and cooking tips. Four more of San Francisco pharmacy um, primary care clinics will host food pharmacy by next year. So these are primary care clinics who are teaming up, I guess, and being having like a food pantry on the side that basically help a patient with groceries, recipe uh, demonstration, and cooking tips just to help people be able to eat healthier um, as to deal with primarily, as I say, blood pressure and diabetes. And I share this with you here because I think this um, is something I've thought about over and over again that I think there should be more and more food pantries that are um, plant-based food pantries, plant-based diet food pantries. So Stancil, um, Stancil no longer has to take so many pills, yet thanks to a new program, he still frequents 
I'm sorry. So meanwhile, diet-related diseases continue to spread. One in three adults in the United States have high blood pressure, elevating their risk for heart disease and stroke. More than 7% of the people have diabetes, mostly type 2, up from 4.4% in 2000. Um, 2000. In 2012, the disease cost the country roughly $176 billion in direct medical expenses. Plus another $69 billion in increase in decreased productivity. Analysis um, at Thomson Ryder um, calculated that reducing employee re health risk such as high glucose and blood pressure just by 1% could save employers 80, 83 to $103 uh, per person annually, just 1%. The program is part of the, a movement to prevent and manage conditions through diet, not pills. Often, we just pile on prescription and ignore the other half of the equation for wellness, which is food, says the San Francisco Public Health um, Department, Dr. Rita uh, Negan, who spearheaded the city's food pharmacy project. A 2015 study in the Journal of Biomedical Education found that only about a quarter of medical students get the recommended 25 hours of nutrition education. And as Nigan um, points out, doctors have a financial incentive not to specialize in primary care. They are paid well to cut out cancer and financial incentives not, to, um, sorry, and to freeze wart but not to spend 15 minutes to talk to someone about their diet. Even with a doctor nudge, um, doctor's nudge, eating healthy is not is easier said than done for poor Americans. Fresh produce is often much more expensive than packaged and fast foods. Um, most of Negan's patients are uh, on Medicaid, and 65% of them lack reliable access to affordable food, a situation experts call food, inse food insecurity. Food insecurity population also see higher rates of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes. San Francisco's, um, San Francisco's food pharmacies are some of, some of a handful that have popped up around the country. Many were inspired by Boston Medical Center, Center's preventative food pantry, which opened in 2001 after doctors realized their patients struggled with food insecurity and its associated maladies and couldn't afford to stock their fridge with fresh veggies and other perishables. The BMC's um, food pantry, pantry's 7,000 monthly visitors now enjoy produce from the hospital rooftop garden. Meanwhile, the impact of food pharmacies can be tricky, says BMC dietitian, um, a dietetics or a technician, uh, Lachman Arali Aralal, because patients rely on them only for some of their groceries. But early indicators are encouraging. After a three-month trial at one of San Francisco pharmacies, 75% of patients reported greater access to healthy foods. And half, and about half reported better blood sugar level, and 38% reported lower blood pressure. Uh, the morning I visited the Silver Avenue Pharmacy, a sunlit room lined by a um, long wooden table and a small corner kitchen, a dietitian handed out cookies made with banana and oats, along with a with printed recipes to about 10 patients. The pharmacy hopes to attract 40 patients every week. Currently, it sees about 10 to 20. Stansel, now a volunteer at the pharmacy, stood next to the gleam, gleaming silver bucket of yellow onions and red apples. A broad man with close-cropped gray hair and a cane declined to take some fresh carrots. Quote, you like um, coleslaw, Stansel asks. Oh man, I love it. Carrots are in coleslaw, the man responded, adding that he had never made it. Stansel nodded and said, we can show you all that. 
So um, this idea here um, is, is actually, I didn't know that was going on, but this is something I've thought about over and over again, this idea of whether it be a health food store, a food pantry, and this idea here of um, just offering uh, healthy plant-based food with fruits and vegetables and recipes and then cooking classes and all that stuff. Um, and I know as a church, we had um, my church had uh, done something similar. We were given out plant-based um, foods and stuff like that in the past a few years back, and then we kind of pulled back away from that. So this is something here that I think is it's it's worthy because it's it's not only helping those who need but those who don't know how to cook the food. So if you help those who know to don't know to cook the food, then just as they say, just changing even a diet by one percent. Always say when I'm doing a cooking class, uh, before I even leave my house, my thought is, uh, if I can just help a person with a cooking class or a seminar. 5%, even if they just change their diet, 5%, that little 5% over the course of a year will do so much better for their diet. Just having them eating a little bit more, just having 5% more plant-based fruits, vegetables, that type of thing in their diet, whole food, whole grain. It is not revolutionary, but it will help. And this is the type of thing that I believe more and more we're supposed to be doing, just helping people along the way, giving them um, whatever that's going to put them in the right path to get them to the point of being healthier. So this is what's happening here. They're doing this idea of dietitians and doctors basically giving people the opportunity, especially people who have food insecurity, which is described as a person who are in lower income, could be on Medicaid and so forth, and they need access to some healthy foods, but they don't have healthy food because of their incomes and probably location where they live so helping them with some food security by giving them access to fruits and vegetables and some healthy food some recipes i think there's a beautiful idea i say i've thought about it well and never know myself that somebody was out there doing this um but it's something that um i, I say must happen because you know, a lot of people, they're going to the food pantries and what they're getting is not going to improve their health and it's going to keep them in the way they are, which is with a lot of diseases. So food for thought, something that's worth discussing and putting back on the table here. So just throwing us out there to you, especially those of you who are listening and into this type of stuff or probably part of my church here. Um, so the main point now I want to go to, which is... Um, uh, this article here uh, on about what's going on in Britain right now. So again, our topic for this morning again is Britain appoints Minister of Loneliness, loneliness, and to tackle social isolation. And this is taken from NBCNews.com and is written by Alastair um, Jameson. And it says it sounds like a character from a dystopian novel. But Britain has created a minister of loneliness to tackle modern public health problems associated with social isolation. The government said Wednesday it appointed Tracy Crouch after research showed as many as 1 in 10 people felt lonely, always or often, and that hundreds of thousands of elderly people have, hadn't spoken to a friend or relative in the past month. Crouch, whose official title is Minister of Sport and Civil Society, will devise a national strategy to tackle isolation across all ages and find ways of measuring alienation in official, stati in official statistics. We know that there is a real impact of social isolation and loneliness of people on their physical and mental well-being, but also on their aspects on other aspects in society, and we want to tackle this challenge, Crouch said. In the United States, approximately 42.6 million adults aged over 45 reported suffering from chronic loneliness in a major 2010 study by the, a by the AARP, AARP, 
Um, the most recent U.S. Census data showed more than a quarter of the population live lives alone. More than half of the population are unmarried. And since the previous census, marriage rates and numbers of children per household has declined. The American Psychological Association heard last summer. Julian Holt Landstad, professor of psychology at Brigham Young University, told the organization that research indicated social isolation and living alone had a significant and equally equal effect on the risk of premature death one that was equal to or exceeded the effect the effect of other well accepted risk factors such as obesity announcing Croach appointment as new minister uh, ministerial lead for loneliness British Prime Minister Theresa May said, I want to confront this challenge for our society and for all of us to take action to address the loneliness endured by elderly, by carers, by those who have lost loved ones, people who have no one to talk to or to share their thoughts or experience with. The role was the main uh, the role was the main recommendation in 2017 report commissioned by the by commission in memory of Joe Cox, a lawmaker and mother of two, who was murdered in the street um, in 2016 by a neo-Nazi terrorist. Uh, Joe Cox recognized the scale of loneliness across the country, and dedicated herself to doing all she could to help those affected. May said, Cox widow widower. Brand, um, Brenda Cox tweeted early Wednesday, One of the awful thing about losing Joe is knowing uh, how much difference she uh, would made in the world. When the kids woke, wake up this morning, I'm going to tell them how, even though she's not here, she's still making the world a better place. We don't know how. However, there was some criticism of the appointment um, on social media with users um, pointing out a link between loneliness and government cuts to community service such as public libraries, daycare centers, and community halls. Um, and so that's the article there. Um, the, this thing here about um, Britain appointing a minister of loneliness and as they say, the problem is large in Britain, but the problem is also happening in the United States. So I'm going to read the three tweets um, that they included in the article. Three different people from Britain who are chiming in on the appointment of this lady here to be the Minister of Loneliness. So important, loneliness and social isolation drive physical and mental illness, especially in hyper competitive, hyper-individual cities like London. So this person, I guess, is attributing it to the lifestyle and the business environment in London. Also, another person tweets that the UK is now so bereaved of empathy. It needs a minister, minister for loneliness. Say more about people than government. Uh, another tweet here is, can't work out why the government have only appointed one minister of loneliness. So I guess this person is saying probably the minister of loneliness is going to be lonely because she's appointed by herself. She needed probably another person to work with. So here you have it. Um, as I say here, um, this person is saying that the society itself is so brief of empathy that um, it is a statement about the people um, more than it's a statement about the government that now you need to put something in place to try to do something to help people who are lonely. So th this is something that, as you know, we talk about here. I talk about here all the time because it is something that I see as the, the article writer quickly show that this is something that's not just going on in America, but it's going on, I mean, not going on in Britain only, but it's going on in America also. That is idea of social isolation, idea of loneliness is a problem. 
and as they stated in a, in a, in the research they believe that it is as dangerous as other even other diseases where it make the person come to premature death and i would assume that um, from what i've studied over the years because uh, the person sooner or later doesn't find much joy in life because most of our happiness in life comes with sharing with others we find it difficult to be in relationships but we find relationships bring that joy to our lives where we can share the things that we do the the, the things that we have everything that we're about we can share with others as they say just being able to have somebody to share your thoughts and share your experience with it is something that is there and this is why i believe that when all things fail when family fail everything fail i really believe in this idea of having something as a community now i know she's appointed because um as i've covered here especially on tuesdays that britain is um has walked away from church but now they're showing that they have basically cut in fundings for um libraries daycares um, and they're cut for community centers. So there's less and less place where people are interacting with each other. And the mall, the shopping mall or shopping centers does not replace this. Because normally it's a, it, that can be a very lonely activity as you do it with other people. There's a lot of people there, but they're not there to per se have community. They're there just to shop. And that has become, I guess, a lot of the city centers. So you can see this, the people have basically walked away from church. Uh, there's not so much activity as they're showing in community centers. There's not a lot of places where people go and connect with people. And if this is what's happening, and this is happening even here, then people end up being by themselves, especially older people, because as one gets older, a lot of the fake friends and the uh, fake family and all that stuff drop off and people become more isolated because they go to their corners so to speak as you get older you kind of select your manner of lifestyle the way you live how you live what you believe in what you practice what um, bad habits you have what good habits and that kind of puts you more and more lonely and a person get to a point where i believe they're just like isolated they're by themselves and so this isolation um creates major pro problem as you say it's a uh, being alone and being isolated is a significant and equal risk to pre um risk of premature debt and it's equal and exceed the effect of other well accepted risk factors such as obesity so you can have a person that's very lonely and they're moving along to debt at the same rate as somebody that's obese which is fascinating so this is where I believe, just like what I covered really quickly about like, it, you know, the church being a solution to the problems um, in the sense that the church is a community. It's one of the things I've advocated for over the years because I've seen where more and more churches are just worship centers. They don't understand the purpose where God has raised them up to be, to be a family. And people go there, but they're still lonely because there's no connection. I believe this is also part of the general culture. As uh, the person had noted, that part of it could just simply be, especially in hyper-competitive and hyper-individual city, you know, where people, the individual is the, the king. These areas could be areas where people become even more lonely. But you could have, in a more rural area, people are very lonely because... Part of the culture, I believe, and especially Western culture, is a very me, myself, so selfish, lonely culture where people just really into themselves and into material possession. And then as they get older, material possession bring no more joy, but they that's the life they built. And they don't know how to connect because they can be very suspicious of monsters everywhere. So this is where I believe where the Bible religion comes in very handy because as i say we are called to be in a, in a family we were not created for isolation we were not created to be by ourselves you know we are created to be with others and we are created to be um in fellowship with others so i'm going to read some text to you just to encourage and to um solidify this point from the bible and from reasoning 
Um, now I have a comment here because the commenters are saying it is really a terrible thing to show how lack of empathy and where the society is, not so much the government is, that you have to basically tell, get a person and pay them and say you are responsible to help lonely people. That tell you how bad the thing is and how a large percentage of our population here in America are suffering from the same thing. So it tells you how serious a problem is where, again, you have to appoint a minister and say, I'm going to pay you to help the people in the society who are lonely because it's affecting the well-being of the society, especially those who are older and even those who care for people who are sick. So again, uh, this is something I've seen, as I say, um, especially because I lived there, I lived in England for a little bit, and then I live here and I can see we have a culture and a society that can be very lonely. And then so much of the people who are lonely, they have to be on all kind of mental health drugs. And the mental health drugs is not fixing the problem because the problem is never going to go away. Imagine if you feel beat and depressed and, you know, just down and feel sad. But the real sadness is because you don't have no social outlet and no friends and nobody to care for you. You're taking the drugs, the drugs are going to be a permanent fix because you never solved the problem. So if the person ever solved the problem, the drugs become now their crutch to lean on. And this is why I believe that some of the drug epidemic is not just because people are just want to be high or have fun or they were in pain and they got the drugs from the doctor and then they became an addict. As many of it is that people are going to the doctor and say, doctor, I need something to take the edge off. And why you have the person have the edge? Because the person don't have that social outlet. They don't have much to make them happy other than probably watching TV, playing video games. And that really don't solve the problem because that's not really a happy pursuit. That's just a pursuit where you sit there and gawk and look. So what's the solution? The solution is that need to solve the problem where the problems need to solve. Problem need to solve where people need to step out of their comfort zone, step out of their culture. This is why I believe a culture can be toxic. You know, every culture has its toxicity. And I believe this is one of the toxicity of the Western culture. And it can't be ignored. And I noticed, as I say, you could go to church. You have, some of the churches I've been to, they're so cold because the culture drives the church. Uh, the gospel doesn't drive the church. They'll say, oh, we believe in the gospel and the Bible only and so the scripture, Torah. And that's just talk. What really drives the church is the Western culture. And so you deal with the church and the church. You could go into the church and nobody talk to you, leave nobody talk to you, nobody care about you. They don't care about each other. You think, well, probably they're into themselves. They're not into themselves. They're into just the culture. And the culture is a culture where it's about me and myself and material possession. And people die lonely or die on drugs because they're trying to solve the problem with drugs and it takes so much drugs to solve this problem. So in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 through 4, it says here, Behold, the Lord hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is his hair heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid your face from you, from um, his face from you, that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongues have muttered, um, muttered perverseness. None call for justice, nor any plead for the truth. They trust in vanities and speak lies, and they conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. It is important to think that part of sin, part of the result of sin and a sinful life and sinful practices and sinful culture and sinful, sinful whatever is literally isolation. Isolation from God, isolation from each other. Um, many of the socially isolated is not a real cause. There's many people who, they're nursing homes, they're living by themselves, and none of their families and friends will visit them because they don't know how to be of themselves. This is why I believe the church have a very important work um, to do. And the truth has to be preached. Gospel has to be preached. Because you can't really solve isolation problem without trying to deal with and address the reason why 
Often people will avoid each other. Notice it says here, they trust in vanities and speak lies. If you trust in vanities, vanities are, I'm going to believe a video game. It's going to solve my problem. It's going to make me happy. More movies, more entertainment, more material possession. That's really not going to do what needs to be done. Because remember, we're created to have fellowship, not only with God, but especially with our fellow human being. And so the society can be like, what this is all about, what life is all about is to gain the, the most toys. But you see one superstar after the other dying. And they're dying of mental health problems. They're dying of depression. They're dying of drug overdose. They're dying. Most of the time you see they're dying of something to do with mental illness or mental well-being, lack of it. So you understand they have all the material possession, they have all the money, all the all the, the fans, but yet they die lonely. So much of them die because they have no friends. And so they kill themselves. And you say, but you have fans. Yeah, fans but no friends. And what the person need is friends. But if you live a certain lifestyle, you're arrogant, you're full of yourself, you think your God gives to the earth. It's hard to be have friends because in order for you to be having friends, you have to be able to see the value of others in, in your life. You have to see the value of having friends. But if you're a person that people, everybody want to be around you because you're famous, well, everybody sees you have value. But do you see others have value? And so the person has to see others have value. And when you see others have value, you make you want to quickly ask for forgiveness, try to do nice things, try to be kind, because you see the person have value. But over and over again, as I as I say, I've lived in westernized culture, I've noticed that, and this could be true for Asian culture, um, I talk about it because I don't, I don't know too much about that culture. I've lived there. But I could see that because I can see, again, they have this, some of these same problems. So it goes true to any culture that lives for isolation. If you don't see the value of others, then you're not going to make an effort to make relationship. And over the years, as I say, dealing with people in the, in the society and dealing with people in the church, in the society... I've seen this over and over again, this idea here that basically I'm good. <laughs> Literally, that's a phrase that they use a lot. I'm good. I'm like, you're dying. Maybe you're good. Uh, but I'm good. It's like a bad statement from the society. I don't know why people say that. I'm good. And it's just part of the culture. And it's not anything to do with, because I, over the years I tried to, I, I, was, I used to say, is it, um, is it, especially when I was a little bit younger, is it nature or is it nurture? But the longer I live, I realize, oh, it's not, it's not nature. This is nurture. This is just something that is inbred. You know, it's just like if you go to another culture and every time somebody hears music, they start dancing. And you'd be like, I hear the music, I don't feel like dancing. Why are they dancing? And I'm like, oh, it's part of the culture. <laughs> it's just something they do. And so it is also, it is something that is nurture, not nature. It's not because this person is from this group, people group, that why they do this. It's simple because it is something that is nurtured in. As you could go into a church and people act as if, I don't need you. I don't need a relationship. I don't need to have you as a friend. I don't need to have you as a brother or a sister in the church because I'm good. And then you start to realize, oh. It's a mindset. They don't see the value of the thing. But when you see the value of the thing, anything, you will pursue it. You will see a value in it. You say, I put $5 on that thing. I put five minutes into it because it has value to me. So most naturally, to me, even this idea of being a minister of, um, of loneliness is, to me, part of it has to be taught. And, you know, I don't know if a minister can teach this, but I have to be taught that, you know, there's things that you have to do for the relationship. You know, I'm sure you've heard the statement, what we need uh, uh, is a relationship with Jesus. I'm sure you put your hand up, you hear people preach that all the time. Uh, but they don't really get into, well, how do you maintain a, a relationship? How do you grow a relationship? 
And part of growing a relationship is that there's t- there's times that you have to do things that is sometimes out of your comfort zone or out of your desire. I have no interest in this thing. I do it because of my friend. I do it because of my spouse. I do it because of the kids. I do it because of God. So this is what they've missed. Because there's times where you might not feel this is important, but because you want to maintain the right relationship with God, with the Spirit, as the Spirit affect your conscience, you readjust. Then later on, after you readjust, you say, you know, it was worth it for the relationship. And it was worth it for me, because I'm doing me a favor. But first, you have to see the value of the relationship. So people say, oh, what we need is a relationship with Jesus. Yeah, but what you need is a relationship, period, and relationships. So first, what we need to do is not so much talk about the relationship with Jesus, but just talk about generic relationships. So when you have a generic relationship, just relationship, any relationship, there are things you will do based on the relationship. So if uh, if you're in a relationship with a person, a person like motorbikes, what can make the relationship increase is for you to take an interest in motorbikes. You might not want to ride it, but probably you want to ride in the back of it. You want to probably watch a two, one or two videos about motorbikes. You can have an understanding of motorbikes. Now somebody say, well, but the person has no interest in motorbikes. Why would a person do this? See, that's a person who don't know how to have a friend. You're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it not for the person. You're doing person for the relationship. It's just you're taking an interest. You just stop for a second and show an interest. But if the person is not interested in the relationship and they really want to be there, they're not going to stop to take show interest. And you can see this the same thing with church. You can see the same thing with certain things. Sometimes I believe that, that people listen to me because we're in a relationship, not because they're interested in the topic I'm talking about. Um, there's topics I talk about that I'm, I have no interest in it. It is, it's doesn't, it doesn't, it's not, it's not interesting to me. Is is I, I don't see the value too much in it, but I see the value in the people I'm talking to. So I go and talk about the topic, but the topic is not a problem for me. You know, I, if I talk about drugs and stuff like that, drugs, not a problem for me. I don't believe in drugs, not even the legal ones, literally. And except probably for an emergency where there's no solution. Well, sure. But even for that, I say, go, man, try to find a, a natural way. But again, whatever. But I'll take interest in topics and study things that it ain't affecting me. It's affecting somebody I know and I'm in a relationship with. You do things for the relationship. And so when you understand, somebody will say, I want to, I want to know God. I want to understand. I believe that there's a being out there that created the heavens and the earth. This can't be by accident. I want to know. What part of knowing is that to align yourself right. To line up with that power that you believe out, out there exists. That's part of a relationship. So most people don't understand. So some, if God come and say, it is your sins. You say, God, I, I, want to, I, want to, I want to get closer to you. So I'll deal with the sin. But I like the sin. But I deal with it because of God. the relationship drives what you do. And it's the same thing with friends or family. If you have uh, a spouse, there are things that you do because, you know, if you do it the opposite, the spouse is going to be upset. So you readjust for the relationship's sake because, you know, if you do this, it will break the relationship. And so there's things you do for the relationship. Now, later on, it becomes a habit. And you just do it then because part of what you do. And I'm sure you've seen this where if you have a person in a relationship that smoke, there's a high possibility that the other person will smoke. If a person is into hunting, the next you know, the other person is into hunting. They start picking up each other's um, practices. But it's not necessarily they want to pick up the practice. They just want to be around the person. They do it for the relationship. So to me, this concept of a minister of loneliness that Britain has appointed is important, but it's important to understand that in the culture, people can be too much into themselves and they have nothing to do with me. And they're not into, well, they're not nothing to do with me, but they have something to do with a person that I love. So I take an interest. Why are you reading that book? I just want to understand a little bit more about this thing that this person is into. 
So in other words, you have to come out of your comfort zone. So if somebody say, I'm lonely, a part of the problem is what the Bible says. A person who is who has friends must show themselves friendly. If a person is lonely, the first solution and first step is that they need to want to have friends. But if a person is lonely and they don't want to have friend or friends, they're going to continue to be lonely. You can't fix that problem. Because part of the problem is in themselves. And so, again, part of the problem is in the person. The person way of doing business. Like I say here, I do this talk program. Part of what I do here is the intention that I want to be able to connect with you. But you might not want to connect with me. You're just interested in the information. And that goes a problem. And we'll read it a little bit. But that goes a problem. The problem is, do you want just the benefit or you want the relationship? The benefit of the relationship or the relationship? We'll deal with that in a second. Um, here um, in John chapter 17, verse 3, firstly, this thought here about what you want. 17 verse 3, and it says, This is life eternal, that they may, might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So, what is life eternal? Is life eternal believing in certain doctrines? Because many churches, that's what they teach. If you believe in certain doctrines, you're ready to be baptized, and you can follow Christ. Or, according to this text, is life eternal a relationship? And one would say, well, no, my church teach me that I have to accept this creed or I have to accept this set of doctrines or I have to go to this church and be a member of this church. Remember in John chapter 4, Christ says to the woman at the well that the Lord is seeking worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth. So truth is important and the spirit of the relationship is important. But... What God, if you add this text now, verse 3 of John 17, you see very clearly here that eternal life is based upon knowing God, knowing Jesus. It is that relationship. See, when you have that relationship, the other stuff happens. Now, if somebody said to me, so, well, could a person be living a moral, sick life and know God? No, it won't happen. Because relationships don't work like that. Remember, when Christ was about to be crucified, they said to Peter, you sound like somebody that's been with him. You sound like. You start to even sound like the person. You start to have the same mindset. When I was growing up, they would say the person knock heads. It's like somebody, they took their, both heads and knocked them together. They hit the head together. And that's what you could say. It's like they start to sound like each other. And if one is corrupt, the other one just get corrupt the same way. If one start doing a certain things, the other one start doing it. I'd be like, you met. I've met people. I'm sure you've met people. You met two female or two male, and you thought they were sisters or brothers, and then you find out they're not because what they knocked head. Um, at least that's how we would say it. They knock head, or they have a meeting of minds. They see eye to eye. That's other ways to to say it. Why? Because of the relationship. The relationship drives behavior. So if you know God, you're going to align yourself a certain way because that's part of knowing God. Knowing, not knowing in a um, surface way, a superficial way, but knowing in an in-depth way, intimate way. And so you start to behave a certain way. So loneliness, part of loneliness is that you got to be able to step out of your zone and say, I want to know. Also, in order to help people who are lonely, you got to be able to get close to them. But it can be difficult in the Western society, as I say. I'm, I, I say this because this is just what I deal with. I'm sure it's difficult in other places because often people don't want you to know them. Because if you know them, you might know that they have problems. But but this again, this is a part of the problem in Western society. People can be a little bit fake in the sense of they act as if they have it all together. You know, because a person can dress a certain way, put on certain makeup, drive a certain car. They seem like they have it together. Uh, really why they're falling apart. So they're kind of like, I think part of the culture is just to keep people away so people don't know that they're a mess. But 
the whole idea of a relationship is not that the person is doing good because we are all sinners and falling short of the glory of God. We all have our messed up concepts and lifestyle. But you know, but you know you have to know with the reality that said they're going to have to be some change. Change is part of it. New interests. New lifestyle practices. And the more you line up with a certain thinking that, that you eat the person and the person, you know, is part of you. But new lifestyle, the way of reasoning and thinking, you understand the way the person go at life. The more you know the way the person go at life, is the more you understand, oh yeah, I see their point of view. And it's deeper. This is why it's important to know that when two people get married, rarely ever are they ever really one at the day they say, I do. It takes years to become one because you, the person love what they don't know. To me, true love is when you know. True love is when you know, especially if you can love what you know. The longer you walk with Jesus in ignorance, you really can't see you love Jesus. Somebody could say, well, that's judgmental what I'm saying. Um, no, it's absolutely true. You, you really love God the more you know God. You know, a person who said to me, I can't understand why there's so much killing or all these things happen in the Old Testament and stuff like that. That's a person so superficial. They really don't know God. So they haven't really understand why God make the judgments he make. So they might love God, but they love God from a point of view of ignorance. But the more you know, if you love, then that's true love. And that's why people can become, you've heard stories of people that have lived together for 50 years and they die within a week of each other because what happened? They can't live without each other because they become one. But that don't happen when a person get married the first three months, the first year. Because that's just throwaway marriage. You can throw that away real easy. Because you don't really know. But when you love what you know, you can say, I love this person. And you've been with them for 10, 20, 30 years. You more trust that. That's more trustworthy. But if you say you love at first year, yeah, that's puppy love, as they call it. That's just, you know, Neanderthal love, that childhood love. But when you know you love something, it's different. So, here, and this is eternal life. Somebody say, I thought eternal life was Christ dying on the cross for a sin. It opened the way. This is where people say, oh, everything is finished at the cross. That's ignorant speaking. They don't know what they're talking about. It's just dumb stuff. Um, eternal life is to know God. But sin causes a separation. So we can't know and we can't love. But... The sacrifice of Jesus made it possible that we can go straight to God. We can love God. Remember, people had a problem with God, especially in the Old Testament, because they see a God there that they have a problem because God hates sin. But when you understand why God hates sin, that's you start to know God. So if a person wants to be deal with loneliness, they have to be able to be vulnerable. They have to be able to be open to others, to know others. They can't be like, oh, this is my culture. This is another thing I think driving and killing the Western culture. Um, go ahead and eat some Indian food. Then eat some European food. Then eat some food from the Caribbean. Start to spread your wings a little bit. Know somebody else. Can't always be about you and your group and your culture. And the flip is the same thing. If you're from somewhere else, learn, learn some other people. Knowing is... The blessing, and I say this last thing before I move on, on this John 17, because this is, this is I could talk for hours on this thing. John 17 again, this is life eternal. You want to be saved, you got to know God. You got to have a relationship with God. And when you know God, it's going to rub off on you. Because that's how it is. That's how all good relationships work. You rub off. We are easily influenced. And to know Jesus. Somebody say, I thought it was something else. I thought it was a creed. It was belong to the right church. No, that is, is a bad thing to believe in something, to have a doctrinal base. But all of that is just an introductory. It's like courting. It's like having a friend. You meet a friend. You say, that person my friend. So how long you know them? For three months. Ah, that's not really a friend. That's a more a, an acquaintance you start getting to be very acquainted with. Uh, come back to me a year from now. Is that your friend? Oh, yes, your friend. Okay. I believe in more now. 
Somebody said, but you're, you're saying the person not honest. No, I'm just saying the person, they don't, they're, they're young. They wet behind the ears. They don't understand. Verse 15 through 17 of the same John chapter 17 says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So here Christ says, his, disi his disciples, his disciples are like him. They're not of the world. They're not worldly. They're not all about this world and its material possession. So this is again part of the thing that happened. When you start to deal with others, you have to take an interest in them. Um, what's your, your birthday? What's your anniversary? Where did you grow up? What was life like when you grew up? Because you're trying to know the person. And the more you know, is the more you're really friends with the person. Tell me some of your secrets. Don't tell me the dark secrets. Just tell me some of the things that the average person would know about you. You show an interest. And so this is what makes good friends because you have somebody that knows you. But I know this is difficult because a person would say, um, a person would say, hey, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, no, because no, it might be terrible. You know, I just really like we all. You know, I, I learned over the years not to be frightened by people's sin and mess, because that's just life. And a lot of people keep, I believe, keep themselves in isolation because they don't want to know nobody to know their mess. But it's not good. I think you just need to keep certain things secret between you and God, and other things you share. And I've met people who have depression problem and it's almost synonymous with depression. Depression and trying to not make nobody know them. It's like it goes hand in hand. Loneliness and the same thing. A person like want to keep everybody away, but that hurts themselves. Um, I'll read this out to finish before I go to one more verse before we close out here. It says, Neither pray I for these alone, but also for them which shall believe on me through their words, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, in I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Notice perfection is connected with this one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. See, this is what the world need. See, the world don't need isolation. In Jesus Christ, we become one like how he and the Father is one. And that's what is needed. When we're created, we're created to be one with two. So this is how we're supposed to be. You're not supposed to be alone. You're supposed to have a friend. Somebody said, well, I need to have a friend in Jesus. You have lost the point. Notice here, Christ was not praying for them to just have a friend in Jesus. He says, I'm praying that they may be one as we are one. God did not intend for us to be so separated. That's something that has gone wrong in our cultures. So lonely and isolated, never supposed to be. And even if we can't be one with our friends and our family, at least go find a church. Go find some people who can actually call you every now and then, text you, visit you, pray with you, care for you, talk to you. Somebody to even share your frustrations with. And sometimes it's just great to have someone just to share what annoys you. But this is not how life is supposed to be. And it's not how any of us are supposed to live. But as I know, you know, the problem is people start to say, oh no, I just need a relationship with God. As a church folk, they lost their minds. This is not what God created us to. God created us to have fellowship with human beings primarily. This is just how it is. We should not isolate ourselves. In Galatians 5 verse 13 and 14, it says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only not use liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the word here for the day. Notice here, when we deal with each other, we love each other as ourselves. How are you going to love each other? You know, you just, do you deal with yourself, right? You live with yourself. You know, you live with others. You bless others. You reach out. 
But first, you have to see the value of others. And you have to see the value of fellowship with others. And somebody say, well, it's going to cost me something. Well, as the, you know, the saying in the, you know, goes, in that if you want the cow, you have to deal with the poop. So that's part of life. If you want a relationship, you have to deal with the poop of the other person. And sometimes figuratively and sometimes literally. And that's just the reality. But, you know, some, you know somebody say, I can't, I can't deal with you. You can't deal with me. Why? Because I have problems and I might come at you a certain way. Well, you know, you don't want a relationship then. You don't want to have the benefit of the relationship. But if you want the benefit of the relationship, you have to deal with the person. It's not the different with God. The, any person that is to me a loner and depressed because they're lonely and stuff like that, and they say, oh, I just need a relationship with Jesus, I know they don't have a relationship with Jesus. Because a relationship with Jesus would teach you how to have a relationship with a human being. You see, God says, thou shalt not do this. You're like, uh-oh, I like that. But I love God, and I want to have a relationship with God. Okay, then, I'll comply. <laughs> That's it. It becomes simple. You can't be a rebel <laughs> and say you have a relationship with Jesus. It's oxymoron. It's a contradiction. That you really don't understand relationships. You see, you sanctify yourself because you make God happy. You want God to be happy with you, right? Some say, oh, is that righteousness by works? No, it's a relationship. You do some things because it makes the relationship happy. Some of you here getting up, going to work now, it's not just for yourself. It's because you can provide and make somebody in, the, in your home happy and your families will depend upon you. If you have families outside your home, depend upon you, you you're doing that. You don't have to do that. You don't have to work that overtime. You don't have to work as hard. But you do that for others also. It's part of the relationship. It's just how stuff works. So, again, I believe, as Britain appoints a minister of loneliness, part of what needs to be taught is that people need to value relationship and value that they have to many a time see the value of, you know, having some people in their life. But some people, they like to push people out of their life because they don't want to deal. But I've learned over the years that, you know, sometimes to maintain relationship, I have to deal with a lot of mess. And the more mess I can deal with is a more relationship I can maintain. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'm just allowing, but something you have to turn the other cheek, you have to go the extra mile. It's just part of relationships. You have to deal with people and the idiosyncrasies and stuff like that. It's just as how they have to deal with me. But when a person don't value relationship, I've had somebody said, this don't have no value to me. And I'm like, yeah, but you're depressed. I didn't say that to them, but I'm looking at them thinking, yeah, but you have clinical depression. There's times you can't even get out of your bed. But they'll tell me to my face, I'm is it painful to hear? Yeah. But also I know they're suffering more. I feel it for them. It made more to cry because I feel it. So why are you suffering for that? All you had to do is just see the value of having a brethren. See the value of having people around you. See the value of sometimes dealing with people and their madness um, so that you can maintain a relationship. Forget the joy out of it. But a person go, I don't have nobody to talk to. Yeah, go pick up your phone and call somebody. Go visit somebody. Yeah, I visit somebody, but they're a mess. Well, hey, that's part of the, part of life. And I'm gonna say, oh, I just need to love God. Yeah, but God is hard to deal with. God don't like sinner. You sinner. God don't like rebel. You rebel. So if you want to deal with God, you have to deal with God requirements just the same way. Somebody say, I want to deal with God. I want to love God, but I don't want to deal with His requirement. You don't know nothing about relationship. You're gonna forever be lonely. So hey. Here we have it, we're simply, God wants us to be in fellowship with him and be fellowship in each other. We have to see the value of having relationships. We have to make an effort because the effort that's made because most of the bad relationship we have with aloneness is not because of nature. It's not because we are born in a certain culture. And we, our DNA is just that way. It's because we have been nurtured into being selfish and being by ourselves and being loners. So in order for you to break that, you have to flip the script and you have to push hard in the opposite direction. Give me a call. Reach out. Do something to via the relationship. See the vibrations and say it's worth money, it's worth time, it's worth prayer, it's worth effort. And all of a sudden you'll find, you make that effort, I tell you within a few months you will not be lonely anymore. 
you'll be one of the happiest well, you'll be happier. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Let's pray. Thank you, O Lord, again for the blessings of this day, for the blessings, dear Lord, of life. I pray that you may bless those of us here. That we may make more effort not only to bless the relationships that we have, but to reach out to more people and to encourage more people, dear Lord, to see the value of family, friends, church relationships, community. Be with us, we pray. And may we be a solution, a salt in this earth. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with me here on Revive Reform Radio. Looking forward to talking to you tomorrow morning where we should talk about um, current events and reach out to somebody. Thanks. Mm -hmm.